Whoever you are, wherever you are, and whenever it is, you are catching some rain waves coming to you from the banks of the implacable and unyielding St. Vrain River in almost always sunny Longmont, Colorado. I'm Ben Kolb, and across the table is the only co-host who had to give verbal permission to Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper for the title of their hit movie, A Star is Born, because it's also the title of her autobiography. She's Becky Peters. Becky, what's good? I can't believe you just told everybody that. It's like out of the bag now. Uh, it's all good, though, Ben. We're proud to be peddling brainwaves and bringing the giants in education to the earbuds of busy teachers so that we can all be more informed, inspired, and connected educators. And to that end, we have a guest today who will no doubt do all of three of those things. But wait, look up there. It's a bird. No, it's a plane. No, it's Super Teacher. In a world gone mad, in a school overrun with disengagement... He was the lone wolf, a maverick teacher who single-handedly could change everything. By day, his PowerPoint stretched bell to bell, and by night, the journals he distributed to students gave them the freedom to write. This fall, he is the teacher hero. All right, all right, hold up. That worn-out script may work in Hollywood, but we know that as teachers, we're way more than a bird or a plane or a pretty face saving a train. The teachers and heroes have the right to bleed. And here to help us rewrite that whole narrative is Cornelius Minor. Cornelius is a teacher, a world-renowned consultant currently at the Teachers College at Columbia, and also the author of the incredible book, We Got This. In this episode, we discuss the damage of the teacher as hero narrative, why our superpower as educators is listening, and how we can promote equity for all kids every day. So without further ado, here he is. It's excellent to be with you, Ben and Becky. I'm so thrilled that you all are doing the work that you're doing. I started out like um, most folks. I was a seventh grade teacher in Brooklyn. So shout out to District 15. I worked at K-429. Um, many New York City schools don't have names. We have numbers. I taught seventh grade with the most amazing team of teachers, parents, and kids on the planet. I could not have asked for a better school community. In that school community, you know, I had a really visionary principal who really made sure that all of us were teaching toward our passions. And she made sure that each one of us in the buildings were leaders. You know, I remember one of my first meetings at the school she asked me, she was just like, well, why do you exist? Like, why do you get up every morning? And I talked to her about how I love skateboarding and how I love art. And she asked me, frankly, then why aren't you doing that? And so she helped me to start a skateboard team. You know, she was that kind of leader. And so everything that I did in reading and writing and social studies and health, you know, those were the subjects that I taught, you know, everything that I did, she made sure that those things always, always, always aligned with my passions. I taught there until 2010. And in 2010, I made the transition to teacher's college. And my work there was really to continue much of what I was doing in my classroom. And that was really centering the needs of the community, student passions, teacher capabilities, and teacher expertise, and really leveraging that into sustainable curriculum. And instead of just doing that in my classroom and in my community, I started doing that all over the world. Well, we definitely want to dive into the book. I'd love to follow up super quick. You mentioned your principal who talked to you about skateboarding and stuff, and that she did a really good job of making sure the staff were all working in areas that they were passionate about. What are some other things she did to help make sure you were all working in things you were passionate about? I know this is going to sound like an odd answer, but one of the things she did was she left us alone. You know, we she was really good about asking us the critical questions that would help us to get at the most important aspects of our pedagogy. And then she would help us to set up benchmarks. And so she would ask us things like, well, how do you know when you're, when you're successful? And so we would develop like shared outcomes and benchmarks, and then she would disappear. And she would allow us to do things, and she would allow us to fail. And we'd reflect on that failure at regular meetings and we would talk about, well, how do I go back and fix this thing? And and what could I add to it? Or what other experts could I talk to? Or who in the school could I collaborate with? And then we would try again. And so I think one of the best lessons that I have learned from her and I continue to learn is that it's okay to, to chase your dream, to chase a passion, and then to discover that it doesn't work. You know, I think so many times as teachers, we discount ideas because we're like, oh, well, that might not work. But in in those missteps, in those failures, I, I've really developed the ability to kind of see where a thing went wrong, 
build on the thing and then try it again. And sometimes I might end up in a completely different place than I intended to, but the discovery and the journey is always like incredible. And so I think um, one of the things that she handed me was just this real nature to be like unafraid of, of failing in public and unafraid of talking about those failures and unafraid of like reflecting on those. And I use lessons from my experience as a classroom teacher almost every day. You know, people often ask me, they're like, well, how did you know to try that thing? And I'm like, well, I didn't, you know, <laughs> I, I just imagined it, you know, that the way that we were going wasn't working. So I fixed this over here or I fixed this over here and, and we tried it again. One of the things that we often forget about, you know, in our pursuit to meet standards, in our pursuit to make sure that we're in compliance, we often forget that that teacher creativity and teacher imagination is a powerful, powerful tool. So when it comes to imagination, if you look at the cover of your book, it looks like an amazingly illustrated comic book and leafing through it, it doesn't seem like a boring textbook on teaching. It, it really reads like a graphic novel, but tons of amazing things you can use right away in your classroom. I'm curious, uh, where did the hero theme come from? Well, it's interesting. That hero theme came from my lifelong love of comic books. The first book that I ever read from cover to cover was a comic book. Um, the first time that my writing was ever published in life, it was published in a comic book. That's been my my thing for my entire life. I go to every Comic-Con, I dress up, I do the whole thing. <laughs> the cover was designed actually by my neighbor and prolific illustrator, Jamal Igel. He is one of the best in the industry. He's most well known for Superman. Um, well, he did Supergirl. He did Batman and Robin for while. He's done um, several books for Marvel. He has an amazing book out right now, um, Molly Danger, that he does that I read with my kids all the time. And um, and so you, I- you. That's amazing. <laughs> I think yeah, you have more you know, muscles than in the picture, but yeah. I guess it works. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I had to be I modest. I had to be that. modest. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. But Jamal is an incredible storyteller, you know, and when I think about the work that he's done in the comic book industry, I want to do that for teachers, you know, that when I read Jamal's comic books, you know, when I read how he drew Supergirl, you know, if you watch Supergirl on the WB, much of those episodes came from his run on the comics. And when I think about what he did for the storytelling and how he would elevate mere storytelling into, into art and into sociology and into history, I want to do that for teachers. And I didn't want it to be a boring experience. You know, I wanted it to be something that we could like look at, think about, revisit and study relative ease. And so, um, so he he did the design. I thought a lot about like what a hero is in a given society. One of the things that that has always perplexed me and really in some ways infuriates me is this notion that when people talk about teachers and teaching, they often use that term hero. And one of the things that I really try to problematize in the book is that when you when you think about how oppression works, you know, one way to oppress people is to silence them. And, and silencing can happen in so many ways. You know, and when we think about how teaching has evolved over the generations, there have been several key moments in history where people desperately wanted to silence teachers. When we think about the American Civil Rights rights movement in the 60s, specifically about Brown versus Board of Education. Much of that activism was church folks and teachers. And there were people who did not want to see, you know, justice happen. And 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 they immediately went to silence teachers, you know. And so that's a history that I'm very well aware of when we consider social movements. And, and when I think about contemporary teaching and contemporary social movements, another way to silence a group of individuals is to deify them. When you deify a group of people, you say, oh, they're gods or they're teachers or, or they're you know, they're superheroes. And so if you apply that to teachers and teaching, so if you say, oh, this teacher is a god or this teacher is a hero, what you begin to do is you begin to erase that person's ability to fail. You begin to erase that person's ability to be sad or to make a mistake, you know? And so what happens is teachers run around schools and they're like, oh, I'm supposed to be this hero. I can't make a mistake or I'm supposed to be this hero. I can't fail. And so then you don't even try. I've seen that happen time and time again in schools. And so one of the things that I really wanted to do with the book is I wanted to create space for people not to be hero, but for people to be human. And I think that's really important. And I, I tweeted a picture of it the other day when I was reading, because you talk a little bit too about teachers being allies, not saviors. Like we're not going in to rescue students from their lives. And your whole book really is about seeing them for the value that they bring into your room. The, the way you think about the student-teacher relationship, even when we first started, when you said you worked with an incredible team of parents, teachers, and kids, like you included all of those stakeholders, not just you and like your seventh grade teammates. That's just a really great way to think about it. And I like how inclusive that is. You start off to on like a, a common ground for teachers, like that there's things that all educators want. And one of the first things you say is that we all 
that we all want better. And I thought that was a really cool, like optimistic, unifying call to action. And can you talk about what you meant by that in the intro and then why you think it's so important to talk about for education? One of the things that still confuses me to this day, well, it doesn't confuse me, I understand why it exists, but people's efforts to divorce teaching and learning and schooling from the the contemporary political moment, you know, um, and when I say contemporary political moment, there have been, you know, we could go all the way back to the 1800s and really think about American education specifically and how American education is political. And, and when we talk about a thing that is political, it's really easy to divide ourselves to say, well, I'm a teacher who believes in this. And so I'm against you because you're a teacher that believes in that other thing. And so I really wanted to think about, well, what are the things that unify us? You know, and so when people ask me about politics, I'm really clear that like I am overwhelmingly pro kid, you know, that it is our job as teachers to teach kids to create opportunities for themselves. You know, first we create opportunities for them, but eventually we want to teach kids to create opportunities for themselves. And we want to teach them to do that work respectfully, you know, thinking about the planet and the people that we share this planet with. For me as a teacher, anything that abridges opportunity is my enemy, you know, and I, and I think it's that simple that it's our jobs to make opportunities for kids. And if there's anything in the community, in the world, in the country, in the school, in the district, that's going to abridge opportunity for kids, I've got to get that thing out of the way. And, and I think that's what we all want for teachers. And so I wanted, well, that's what we all want as teachers. And so I wanted to start on some common ground there to say, yeah, we all want better, but for many of us, the challenge is how do we actualize better? And that's what I wanted. We got this to be, it's just a manual for like, yeah, you know, we sit around and want better, but sitting in your living room or jumping on Twitter or getting on Facebook and saying, well, this is what I believe isn't going to make that thing happen. We actually got to get out there and do it. So as a follow-up then, can I ask maybe when you were in the classroom or, or maybe how you've helped teachers navigate it from 2010 to now in your in your current position, can you think of a story when you were either successful at navigating a contemporary political moment in class with your students or maybe failed at it and how that helped you grow? Oh, absolutely. And um. And, and I think success is such a bizarre term to use. I think everything that we do is, again, iterative, like that that even a thing that felt successful a year ago or a month ago or a week ago, you know, now that I'm more mature, I know a lot more and I can look back at that thing and I can say, wow, if I were to do that thing again, here's how it would go. And so, so there are successes that I look back on now that I'm like, oh, well, here's some things that I could add to it or here's another group of people that I could have included. There's so many stories that I could um, tell. Like one, one defining, moment in my career that I think a lot about is um, there's a moment, gosh, this must have been maybe 2008 um, for me. And I'd taken um, my, I, I coach sports. And so I coach a soccer team, skateboard team. Um, and it's, you know, and it's been one of the great joys of my life forever, but I'd taken my soccer team out to just like visit a museum after a game. We had a game in Queens and, um, and after the game, we still had some daylight and I was like, Queens has some amazing museums we can't go back to Brooklyn without just dropping in, you know, and seeing some art. And so we dropped in on a museum, you know, we're all in our soccer gear. It's like post game, you know, and the kids are super mellow. So we're just kind of like touring the museum. And again, New York city is that kind of city where you can just like have a soccer game and then go to a museum. Um, and, um, and so we dropped in on this museum and, um, and we were on our way out and, you know, in the way that you exit through the gift shop, one of the kids got apprehended by museum security and the, and the security guard like snatched him up and was just like, ah, you stole something. And I'm going to kind of pull you to the back. And, and the kid like refused to move. He's like, I'm not going to move without my teacher. And there's, and there's my teacher over there. And so of course that's me. And so the security guard comes and like grabs me by the arm as well. And so starts kind of yanking us to, toward the back of the store. And the security guard is like yelling at both of us that like, you know, this kid stole something and he's going to like deal with it and we're going to pay consequences and all this. And you kind of give the rest of your team that look like nobody move, everybody play it cool. I'm, I'm going to figure out a way out of this. And so I'm already running calculations in my head. And, um, and, and as I kind of made eye contact with each member of the team to ensure that they knew what to do. Um, and it's that silent eye contact that no educator ever wants to have to make. But as I start to make eye contact, I could see a light bulb in one of the kid's eyes and he began to approach the officer. Um, and I, and almost as he was realizing it, I was realizing it at the same time, but you know, we just left a soccer game. And if you've ever played soccer, you know, that soccer uniforms have not a lot of pockets. There are no pockets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so we, so we couldn't have stolen anything because none of us had pockets. And so you could see this kid like, kind of get that idea. And so, and, and at the same time he had the idea, I had the idea and he starts approaching the cop, but you know, for any of us who've seen the news and you've seen how like, you know, 
high, high tense, you know, high tense situations happen. You know, it's one of those things where I kind of waved them off. I'm like, right now is not the time to approach this cop. And I just remember the severe humiliation that I felt and that entire team felt in that moment that we were 100% innocent. Like no one had stolen anything, you know, that we didn't, you know, and the cop kept yelling that, oh, you put it in your pocket, you put it in your pocket. No one had pockets, you know, um, and, and eventually, you know, that whole situation got resolved like three hours later. And I remember just, but the embarrassment that one feels, like, even though you're 100% innocent, even though, you know, like you did nothing wrong, you know, and I'm the adult that's supposed to usher these kids through the city in safety, you know, and the people who are employed to keep us safe um, did everything. But, and I remember um, the kids asking me as we were finally on our way home, they were like, why did you tell us not to say anything? Like, we knew that we didn't have pockets. Like, why did you tell us not to say anything? And it was one of those situations where you kind of really have to have that talk. We're like, you know, it's a bunch of brown boys in a shop being yelled at by a cop. If any one of us had spoken up or said something and that been construed in the wrong way, you know, things could have been really bad for us. And the kids got that, you know, the kids got that. And I remember getting back to school and all of a sudden it became hard to teach social studies. You know, like you think you can't teach kids to conjugate verbs when this thing happened to you yesterday. And so um, and I remember talking to my my colleagues about it. And and a lot of my colleagues were like, we should turn this into a unit of study that we should study this and really kind of think about this. And what it became was this like wonderful like exploration into like what it means to be a member of a community and what it means to have membership in that community with brown skin or what it means to have membership in that community if you're gay or what it means to have membership in that community if you're poor or if you're a woman and and the kids produced some amazing writing they did incredible interviews they they did some really like powerful advocacy and activism and when i think about the moments that 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 define me as an educator. You know, that's one of them. And, and, and what happens is there are these instances in life where the world hands you a curriculum, where you don't get to choose. It doesn't come from your superintendent. It just kind of comes from the lives, you know, that the kids lead. And, and if you're observant and if you listen, you can do really powerful things. And, and that's what I wanted. We got this to be. I really wanted it to be a way for people to be super observant about who their children are and what their children need so that we could craft the curricular experiences that deliver that for them. I, I don't even know how to respond to that story. I, in my 33 years of life, have never had something like that. And it's something that my, my own children will never have to, to mm -hmm. deal with. Like what can, uh, don't even know how else to ask it, but how can, um, we help that problem, I guess. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I think a lot about, I, I have an incredible partner. My, um, my wife is one of the, the best people on the planet. And, you know, we were talking one evening about sexual violence. Um, and, and she does a lot of work with sexual violence prevention and education. And she, you know, does a lot with like rape survivors and things like that. And we were talking one evening about some of her work and her passions. We had this really intense conversation. And one thing she said to me, she's like, you know, Cornelius, you need to be talking to your friends about rape. And I remember my reply was like, well, my friends are all skateboarders and soccer players. Why do I need to talk to my guys about rape for, you know, that's a woman thing. And her response to me, she was just like, you know, Cornelius, women did not invent rape. We don't perpetuate it. We don't benefit from it. Like rape is not a woman problem. It's a man problem. And, and, and in order to solve this, we need better men. And so if you're not talking to your guy friends about this problem, then you're complicit. When I think about things like racism or ableism or classism, again, you know, when I think about like race in America, it's not a brown folks problem. It's not a people of color problem. It's a white folks problem. And I've thought a lot about what it means to be the kind of white person who works on this stuff, you know, and I've never been white a day in my life. But, you know, it's about like educating, you know, your friends and helping like people to understand like what other groups of people go through. You know, empathy is a really powerful tool. And I think so much of policy, both in and out of education, is made with little regard to empathy. It's made with little regard to what people are going through in their communities, little regard to what people need. And any attempt to serve people without truly being empathetic, any attempt to serve people without true understanding is not service, it's colonization. And I think that school has had an incredibly colonizing presence in this century and in the last century, and that I'm really all about decolonizing school. And one of the ways that we decolonize school is we really seek to understand each other. And so I think that, you know, if I were a white person, I would spend time talking to other white folks about 
being anti-racist, talking to other white folks about understanding poverty and how poverty impacts specific communities in different ways and understanding even ability and understanding how disability impacts kids' performance in school and how we can, you know, do better to create access. And so really it's A, education, B, empathy, three, action, C, action um, would be kind of like my recipe. That's, I really like that analogy too, because you're right. I mean, there's, there are horrific things that happen all over the place. And, you know, sometimes you're the the part of the perpetrating group, sometimes you're part of I, like, I, I don't know that I just, I really appreciate that, that um, metaphor that you shared and your wife sounds like an amazing person. And I, um, did, she works in education as well. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She is. Um, she's actually the best teacher I've ever met. I I'm that scandalous yeah. guy. I married, I married the teacher upstairs. So <laughs> <laughs> good for you, man. Good for you. <laughs> but I mean, and a lot of what you just talked about reflected, you know, begin by listening, you know, again, like the, the whole book really just how, how do we get to know our students better? And then in your words, bend the curriculum towards them. And one of the questions that I, that I really liked is when you said you try to meet all of your students by asking, where is the poetry in this young person? Um, how does that question help you serve the students? Yeah, well, you know, I think I got to start by saying, you know, I grew up in hip hop. I'm a New Yorker um, <laughs> and, you know, I'm 40 years old now. And so I was like in that whole movement um, growing up. And and one of the questions that hip hop has always asked, that poetry has always asked, is that you look at an everyday object. You know, I'm in my office right now looking at a water bottle. And, and you look at that water bottle and you're like, where's the poetry in this? How can I talk about this in a way that no other person has talked about this thing? Or you look at a leaf or a flower or, or a beautiful person and you ask yourself again, like, where's the poetry in this thing? How can I describe this thing, approach this thing, talk about this thing in a way that no other person has done it? And Early on, before I even knew a lot about teaching, I knew a lot about verse. And so I would approach my classroom that way, where every kid I saw, I was like, how can I see this kid like no other person has seen them before? And how can I speak to them? And how can I describe them? And how can I teach them like no other person has done before? And, you know, and the beauty in poetry is that the poet sits with a pen or walks through nature or walks through a city and and they try a thing and it doesn't work and they try it again and it doesn't work and they try it again. And, and for me, that that's teaching that like, I want to find the poetry in this kid. So I'm going to try to reach this kid in one way and it might not work. And I'll try it again in a different way and it might not work. And I try it a third way. And I think that that's it, that the poet's job is to be observer. And I think that so many times when we think about our jobs as teachers, so little of that time is spent observing. And again, I wanted to use We Got This as an opportunity to bring people back to that, that that we can look for the poetry in young people. You know, often when you ask people to describe the students that they serve, they start by saying he's a reluctant reader, or they start by saying she's dyslexic, or they start by saying that she's four grade levels behind. And, and those things are important for us to understand, but that is not the entirety of a kid. And so I want to meet the kid where the poetry is. Well, and it's kind of like you talk about too, sorry, um, when you talk about, you know, me as a new teacher or me as a veteran teacher and just whatever labels we use, which like you say is necessary shorthand, but at the same time, we can't let ourselves forget all of the things that we are that aren't described by that label. Yeah, exactly. And what happens is these labels get us caught into these ways of thinking, you know, and I think it's so easy to call oneself a veteran teacher and then stop learning, or it's so easy to call oneself a new teacher and give up. And yeah, I might be a new teacher, but I've lived life. I know kids, you know, I've got a lot of passion. I can bring those things to the classroom. And, and so the label new teacher obscures everything that I might know about community or about kids or about passion. Yeah. So I'm finding labels to be incredibly problematic and people have a hard time thinking around labels, you know? And so once a kid gets that label, you know, there's that theory of, you know, in disability studies of disability spread that, um, that once a person is labeled, what happens is that label actually grows and, and consumes that person's humanity. And so really beginning to think, how can I begin to, to think flexibly and to act flexibly so that I can see behind and around and through the labels that we have haphazardly slapped onto kids? Which probably would have helped a lot in that museum scenario if the cop had thought about you guys differently. <laughs> I mean, that's it's, it all ties together. It's yeah, beautiful. Exactly. Yeah, so you mentioned hip hop being a big part of your life. Can you talk to us about how hip hop has impacted you as an educator and then the hip hop ed movement, what it is and um, how teachers can bring it into their classroom? You know, and it's it's so funny. Again, like I, I talked about comic books being a huge influence, hip hop being a huge influence. Like um, for me, um, 
it's really hard to talk about how it's impacted my life because it's everything. You know, it's almost like asking the question, how does your like circulatory system impact your life? You know, it's, 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 it's just omnipresent, you know, that like that, that hip hop is how I talk. It's how I write. It's how I teach. It's how I, you know, move through space. There's a, there's a moment in every civilization where art becomes product. And when art becomes product, there are so many problems there. And and so oftentimes when people, you know, say the word hip hop, what they're talking about is product, um, something that can be packaged and consumed and sold. And, you know, and, and when I think about hip hop, I often think about the ethos of the art and, you know, I think about the heart of it. And, um, and one of the things that I think about is at the heart of hip hop is innovation, that cool Herc you know, threw a birthday party for his sister in the Bronx and had two turntables and wanted to figure out how to run them together, you know, and, and that is innovation, you know, that at the heart of hip hop is engineering, it's innovation, it's iterative design. So I'm going to like run these turntables together and see how it works. It, it worked okay for this party. I'm going to improve it for the next party. I'm going to add speakers, you know, okay, that was okay. I'm going to improve it for the next party. I'm going to add break dancers, you know? And so when I think about my teaching and, and how hip hop has really moved me, it's really made me fearless around the act of creation. That when we think about the pioneers and the architects of the culture, those people were fearless around creation. And so, and what happens as a teacher is, you know, you're told what to do, or, you know, a principal hands you a curriculum and you can't, you know, color outside the lines. And if you do, you're scared and you're watching your back or you're closing your classroom door. And so one question that I've continued to ask myself throughout my career is how can I be fearless in that art, that act of creation? And so I would say that's probably the dominant influence that hip hop has had in me, just like um, really kind of sharpening my desire to create. Um, And then of course, there's the words. I'm an English teacher, you know? And so this idea that people can take words and and weave those words together in order to do powerful things, you know, like I started my career teaching in the Bronx and, and it was really powerful to be teaching, you know, the nieces and nephews and little brothers of the architects of this, you know, culture. You know, if you ask me, the whole universe is centered around the Bronx, New York, because, you know, hip hop touches everything now. (laughs) When we think about, you know, the way that people talk to each other in states like Iowa, the way that people dance in places like, you know, Paris, you know, hip hop is everywhere and all that came out of the Bronx. So it's something that I like that I'm, you know, I hold very dear. Yeah. So it's had this incredible influence, but it's really hard to kind of separate that influence from who I am because it's like legit in my DNA. And so like the idea of innovation, the idea of iterative design, the idea of community that you cannot create hip hop without a community. If there is no crowd, there's nothing for the MC to do. If there is no crowd, there's no one for the DJ to move. And oftentimes we talk about teaching and we talk about teaching in a way that's divorced from the crowd, the kids and the parents. And so if there are no kids, there is no teaching. And so to go to a teacher conference and you hear all these speeches, but then nobody mentions kids, you're like, what the hell is happening here? You know? And so, and hip hop has really helped me to hold on to that. Wow. Do you ever just like listen to yourself back? Cause you're so good. <laughs> you really like, I have for real, man, like this whole thing has just been mic drop after mic drop. Seriously. Other than like West Coast rap being better. I agree with everything you just said. Um, <laughs> I, and I had never, you know, my, my, my zip code will not allow me to respond to that statement. <laughs> I have never thought about hip hop in that way. I, I do view it as the product and that's, that's beautiful to think that hip hop is teaching people to be fearless in creation. So what are some tangible ways that teachers can do that? How, how come you're fearless in your creation? What did teachers do for you and, and what can our teachers do for our kids? Well, um, and I think I got to start there um, with, with an examination of what school is. And one of the things that I, um, inherited actually from my dad. My dad used to always say to me, you know, Cornelius, you should never let school get in the way of your education. And we have a notion of what school is. School is be quiet, sit still, listen to me. And when you think about those skills, be quiet, sit still, listen to me, that is not a recipe for success in any industry. (laughs) You can get nowhere by being quiet and sitting still. And, And so one of the things that I'm often thinking about is true creation is messy it's noisy. And so where's the space for that in the school day that, you know, teachers get most nervous when their classrooms are loud. Teachers get most nervous when their classrooms get messy and you can't create anything in a sanitized environment. And so one of the things, one of the first steps I would say is like that we create spaces in our classrooms to allow kids to get messy. You know, I came up 
in reading and writing workshop. And when you think about what a workshop is, a workshop is ultimately hip hop. It's like, I'm going to show you this cool thing. So this writer move or this reader move, I'm going to show you this thing and I'm going to model it for you. And then I'm going to give you a chance to try it out. Now you're going to go try it out and it's not going to be perfect because no one gets a thing perfectly on the first attempt at anything, but you're going to go try it out and you're going to make a big mess of things, but then you're going to figure out how it works for you. And so really creating those spaces, like where's the space in my classroom for kids to approximate. If I were giving teacher advice, I would say the first step is to embrace approximation that no kid ever is going to learn a thing from you and do it perfectly the first time. And, and to expect that of kids is an unrealistic expectation. You know, I'm a skateboard coach. And one of the things that I say, and I don't know if Ben, you're a skateboarder, or Becky, you're a skateboarder. But one of the things that I always say that if I were to teach you, Becky, a new skateboard move, there's a 100% certainty that the first time you try that move, you're going to fall. And, and when you fall, you're not going to fall because I'm a bad teacher. You're not going to fall because you're a bad learner. You're going to fall because you're new. And the way that learning goes is, Becky, you're going to fall the first three, seven, 21 times. And so this whole idea that, oh, I taught Becky the thing and she got it is a false notion um, that like, yeah, that any kid that comes to class and they get it on the first try, they didn't really learn that thing from me. They knew it before they came to class. That like, but actual learning is Becky's going to fall one time. She's going to get back on the board. She's going to fall again. She's probably going to bleed. She's going to want to quit. I've got to like help her back up again. She's going to try it 20 more times before she finally starts to get it. And when you look at a typical classroom, nobody or very few people embrace that. And so people are like, yeah, I taught essay and the kid tried it once and he didn't do well. So I failed him, you know, and, and you're like, what is that? <laughs> that I've got to create multiple opportunities for kids to try this thing. So how do we be better colleagues to each other too, but then we're, when we're trying to experiment like that, like how, I mean, you help teachers all day long. And I think a lot of the power is in the people in your hallway and around you every day. Like, do you get into each other's classrooms? Do you, you know, co-teach? Like, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I'm a huge believer in um, everything that I've learned, Becky, like everything I've learned it from the teachers around me, that there's not a single thing that I've learned that came from my classroom alone. That, um, that I am a product of every teacher I have shared a classroom with and shared a hallway with. And, and that's something I'm upfront about all the time. But we are really deliberate in that, that these things aren't accidental. I remember my first year teaching, um, I was in the Bronx. I had a teacher mentor um, named Miss Disbrow. And Miss Disbrow was just like one of those Bronx veterans. I mean, this woman could teach a fish how to swim. I mean, she was just incredible. And I remember just being a first year teacher, not knowing anything. And I would sit in my prep and try to plan and I could never, you know, get it right. And so Miss Disbrow invited me to her room one afternoon and she was like, look, your prep is third period every day. Just come watch me teach third period every day. And then the next day you do what I did. And so I did my, my first year of teaching, I was always a day behind Miss Disbrow. So I would spend third period watching her teach. And then and so I'd watch her teach on a Monday and then I'd teach that lesson on Tuesday. And then I'd watch her teach on Tuesday and I'd teach that lesson on Wednesday. And so it was almost this Simon Says like way of getting better where I would just watch the best person on my hallway and then I'd go try to be her the next day. And, and I remember that was such an education for me. And she just took exquisite care of me. And, and I remember when she retired, I cried like a baby. I could not deal. Um, but, <laughs> but then, um, but, but one of the things that happened is, you know, you develop this way to stand on your own two feet. And I remember not knowing how much I had improved until she'd retired. And, and I remember once she even came to visit me for lunch and I was so proud to tell her, I was like, yo, that thing that you did that one time, I did it without you. And, um, oh. and she's like, I know kid. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and that for me formed the blueprint of the relationship that I wanted with other teachers that you can come to my room, we can watch each other, that there's no judgment here. You know, Miss Disbrow wasn't perfect, but she was more of a teacher than I was in that moment. And so I learned everything that I could from her. And, you know, and when people come to see me, I'm not perfect, but, you know, but I have things to give and we have things to learn from each other. And so, um, and so I make time now as a coach, I actually schedule time for us to watch each other and work with each other. And so um, almost once a week, 
Um, there's scheduled time where we're in each other's classrooms, where we're reflecting on practice, we're watching specific teaching moves. So we'll say, well, this week, we're all going to pay attention to how Cornelius does independent reading. And then we're going to think about it, you know, like ask some questions and then think about what that might look like in our classrooms. And then next week, we're going to go see Becky. And then the week after that, we're going to go see Ben. Um, but that, yeah, that we make specific scheduled time to do some of that work. And then we make specific time to practice our learning that I think so many times we go to professional professional development and we learn, but then we don't think about, well, when would I practice this learning? And so I sit with teachers and we schedule when we're going to execute the learning. So we'll say today we learned this. And so when are we going to try that? We're going to try that next week on Thursday, fourth period. Then we're going to try that on Friday, sixth period. And then we're going to reflect on Monday morning during our team meeting. And so really setting up that time for like, yes, we learned this thing. And so now here's when we're going to practice it. And I, I love that too. Like an incredible gift that she gave you um, by allowing you yeah. in her room every day. Like it's just so, it's so trusting and beautiful. But I think that's how we need to move together as educators to be the best that we can be for yeah. and with our students. Um, and it just, I think it takes such an act of humility for you to be a learner in other people's rooms. Um, and then also of courage for other people to let you into their rooms. But if we can all do that more and like norm that better for each other, um, I just, that yeah. that's how we would all get better. I'm curious what well, you're, I mean, your, your world is literacy, right? Literacy instruction and, um, reading and writing workshop. Exactly. So when you do those studies with teachers, um, let's get into the weeds a little bit. What kind of practices do you see in literacy instruction that you wish would like vanish from the earth and which practices do you wish you'd see in more places? Oh, I, I can name names. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> so, so the opposite this, of Miss Disbrow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I think one of the things that that really kills me is this notion that we know best as far as kids and their book selection. That somehow I can approach a kid and tell them what the best book for them is. Like I detest that. Um, I am a huge proponent of like guiding kids into appropriate book choice for themselves and really crafting independence um, around book selection. That it is not my job just to teach reading. It's my job to create readers. Um, and um, and there's so many people who approach reading. Um, like this, like, and it is a clinical thing, but they approach it like this clinical thing for kids. And, and one of the things that I have spent my career doing is I, you know, and I, I told my mentor this early on, I wanted to become the best book dealer in Brooklyn <laughs> where I was just like, I, I want every kid in Brooklyn, if they want a book, they're going to have to come through me. Um, and, and that was just my goal. I was just like, I want to be that on the scene. Um, and, and so everything that I did in and out of my classroom was to that end where I'm like, if you are a kid in this borough and you want the coolest book, you're going to have to find Mr. Minor, or you're going to have to find, you know, another kid that knows Mr. Minor, or you're going to have to work with a teacher that's worked with Mr. Minor, you know, and like just that whole idea that like we can make books like this thing. And so I think one practice is that, um, and we're just getting into it kind of like, globally now, but this idea that, that we're not just here to teach reading, but we're here to create book culture. Um, and that book culture doesn't come from the teacher yelling mandates at kids. Um, but book culture comes from like teachers really creating powerful experiences in and out of books with kids. Um, and so that would be one practice right away. The second thing would be um, independent reading, that that so many folks assign reading as this thing that happens at home. You know, when we look at the history of reading and writing instruction in this country, and especially in middle school where I'm situated, is that when we think about literacy, historically, writing is something that has been assigned and not taught. You know, so when kids enter secondary schools, you know, your teacher says, write this essay, it's due on Friday. Your teacher says, you know, read this book, it's due on Thursday. Um, and really, I've been wanting to slow that down, that it's not about us showing up and giving these complicated or these beautiful assignments. It's about us showing up and giving powerful demonstration um, and really helping kids to see that, yes, I want you to write an essay and this is how it's done. This is how it's crafted. And so um, there's not enough teaching of the how. And I think in secondary school, there's still way too much of just telling and assigning. And we know, and we have known for generations that telling is not teaching. Um, and so just like really solid demonstration, really solid showing, I think is really um, important for kids. And, and I see it left out of too many instructional experiences. Um, another thing that I'm a huge fan of is um, 
that we allow kids to have agency. You know, so many times education is a thing that is done to children and not with them. Um, and so that's, that's a, a, a big beef I have um, with the profession. And again, we're moving in these directions. So I'm not saying anything that any other scholar um, who has studied um, is saying, but these are the things that I see over and over and over. And if I had a magic wand and could change it all, like um, I would definitely, you know, change toward, um, you know, more sustainable and inclusive practices for kids. Telling is not teaching. That's that's another one we want to highlight and tweet all over, man, because that's that's so true. So how do you envision that as far as the modeling of, of the writing that you sit down as a class and you just put your cursor on the screen and go and or, yeah, talk to me about what that would look like? Um, um, and it looks, you know, and, and lots of people have studied this, you know, again. And so it's um, it's something that I've inherited from my mentor, Lucy Hawkins. Um, but um but one of the things that I do is I think about like um, if I want a kid to craft an essay, one of the first things I've got to do is I've got to sit with my team and I've got to really think what are the skills required to craft an essay. Um, and just like you take a thing like an essay, for example, like um, what's interesting is like when you think about how you were probably taught essay or how, you know, many teachers in your school probably teach essay, you know, some teacher shows up and they say, here's a body paragraph. Here's what goes in your body paragraph. Here's what goes in your intro paragraph. Make sure you got five of them. And there's this like, fill in the blank thing that kids do. Um, and, and when you think about that, that's a structural approach, that's structure. So I'm telling you what goes into paragraph one and telling you what goes in body paragraphs and telling you what goes in a conclusion. And there's nothing wrong with teaching structure, but when you think about what an essay is by definition, an essay is a journey of thought. So, so if a kid knows all the structure in the world, but has no thinking, you're not going to have an essay, you know? And so I go into so many schools and I look at the essays that are posted on the wall and you've got this well-structured crap where kids got like, you know, the great structure, but they're not saying anything. Um, and so when I think then I sit with my team and I'm like, all right, what do we want to teach kids? First thing we want to teach kids how to have thoughts. Um, and so, so then with my team, I've got to sit and say, well, how do we as adults have thoughts and how do we as adults look at a text or look at an occurrence and then craft a thought around that text. And, and oftentimes what happens in so many schools is we teach these recipes that don't really work in the world. And so whenever I sit with teachers, I really want to do the metacognitive work with adults to say, hey, you're an adult that has thoughts, and tomorrow we've got to go teach kids to have thoughts. And so how do you do that thing as an adult? Um, because when you say it in front of that room, you've got to say to kids, today I want to teach you how to have a thought and one way to do that is, and I want you to watch me as I craft a thought, you know, and so we're inviting kids to watch us, um, you know, and one of the things that I've learned from skateboarding is, um, you know, and I, I had a coach who said to me once, um, you know, I was, um, for many years, um, I, I'm, I'm very competitive. And for many years, I, um, I, I competed at, you know, at pretty high levels with my students. And there was one tournament that I just couldn't win ever, you know, and I invited a bunch of coaches to come watch me coach. And I was like, Hey, a lot of you are more mature than me. You've been coaching longer than me. Can you just tell me what I'm doing wrong? I can't seem to get my team over the hump. And one of the coaches said to me, he's like, you know, Cornelius, um, the ceiling on your kid's ability is your own understanding that your kids won't skate better until you skate better. You know, that your kids can't supersede you, you know, and I think that that's true in the teaching of language arts that like oftentimes the ceiling on our kids achievement or on their progress is our own ability. And when you think about like a thing like essay or anything, really, many times kids can't do a thing. It's because we can't do the thing or because we haven't shown them in public how to do the thing. And so oftentimes I'll invite teachers to kind of walk through their own process and think about their own metacognition and we craft lessons from there. So I'm not going to sit in front of a class and craft a whole essay, but when I show up to class tomorrow, I'm going to sit in front of the class and I'm going to say, we're crafting essays and I want to show you one aspect of essay creation. I want to show you how to have your initial thought. So I want you to watch me as I consume this text and I'm going to generate a bunch of thinking. And then I want to see if you can do the same thing. And so it's legit. Simon says, like, I'm going to do the thing in front of you in this really super articulated, super visible way. And then I'm going to create space for you to do that thing. Now, when I create space for you to do that thing, I have to expect that you're not going to do the thing perfectly. That again, going back to my skateboarding metaphor with Becky, I'm going to teach Becky how to do the move and then Becky's going to fall. So I'm going to teach Becky how to craft a thought or how to craft a complicated idea. And the first two or three times she does it, it's not going to go well. Now, my class has to accommodate for Becky's approximation. Um, and I think that that's really important in the teaching of language. 
Wow. And that's a lot what your teacher did for you. Yeah. You watched it and you did it. Yeah. That's cool to go full circle. Well, another thing you said that that I really liked um, was just that we need to give students agency. But I know a lot of teachers' hesitation to that is that once they do that, they lose control. And you had a beautiful quote that creating a space where kids feel safe means that we create a space where we share power Mm -hmm. and you can let go of power without letting go of control. So can you tell me how we can do that? Yeah. um, There's an interesting, um, again, I study way too much. And so I often veer into extreme nerd territory and I fear I might be going there now. But when you think about like, um, (laughs) but when you think about um, uh, like um, Isaac Newton, um, gravity, um, when you think about like, um, like force and motion. Um, there's one of Newton's three laws is that, you know, for every force, there is an equal and opposite force. You with me there? Yep. Does that that makes sense. Yeah. And so, if so, and so here's the thing, if I'm a teacher, right. And, and, and I erect myself in the classroom as an absolute power. So I am holding all the power, like I'm a force. And what happens for every force that you create, there has to be an opposite force. And so if I'm in a classroom and I'm holding all the power and I create that, like somebody in that classroom has to take me out. Like they have to, um, because that's what Newton's law say. Like if for every force, there's an equal and opposite force. So there's some kid somewhere that has to take me out and it's physics. It has to happen. And so, um, so whenever I craft, like, or I think about power in a classroom, I think about Newton again. And I think about, you know, the way that you topple a force is by applying opposite force. And so kids can topple a classroom by simply applying opposite force. But here's the thing. If power is evenly distributed along a system, you can't topple that force because it's evenly distributed. And so I want to share power. So let's say I'm in a classroom um, and I might something as simple as I might make Becky the timekeeper in the classroom. And so now that Becky's the timekeeper, Becky has a little bit of power. I just handed Becky power. So Becky's a 14-year-old kid. I just handed her a little bit of power. I might make Ben um, in charge of like gathering materials. So I just handed I'm a good encourager too. But I yeah, I guess that works too. Yeah. So so whatever, you know, I might hand Ben a little bit of power. And so what happens now, if you want to disrupt that class, you've got to go through Ben and Becky and me. Um, and it's much harder for a kid to do that. Um, and so one of the things that I want to do is I want to create multiple points of investment in a classroom because if Ben and Becky are invested, because if Ben's like, yo, I'm in charge of encouraging, so you can't mess this up for me. Like, it's so much harder for a kid to like go through their peer and the teacher, you know, it's really easy for a kid to go through the teacher. And so one of the things that I do in a classroom is I really create multiple points of investments for kids. So I'm like, okay, how can I get Ben invested in a way where if anyone tries to disrupt this class, Ben's going to be like, oh no, not on my watch. And how can I get Becky invested in a way where if anybody tries to disrupt the class, Becky's going to be like, oh no, I'm in my groove, not today, you know? And so what happens is, (laughs) so what happens is I never have to deal with like discipline issues because Becky's going to be like, nope, today's my favorite day. You're not going to mess it up for me today. And then Ben's like, oh, nope, not today. You know, and so I think that that's really important. And so I think about sharing power by simply like empowering kids to to produce and to create in ways that feel very personal and very real to them. Hmm. And I like how you said that too, like, um, how can I raise a kid's status in front of their peers? Like that, um, yeah. how you tell that story in the book too is really cool. Did you, did you have something to say? I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, so can I ask one more and then we'll let you go? Cause I know we're running up on time. Um, but I, one of the things I kind of want to circle back to is um, if it, that, one of your premises is if you don't teach in a community with deep community engagement that you're not teaching, it's more like colon, like uh, colonizing. Right. And so I'm, 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 yeah. I would love um, some tangible tips or like some stories or something about how, how you teach with deep community investment. Um, yeah. I just, I, I want more help with that. Yeah. Simple. Like um, one of the, the most influential relationships that I've ever had in education was um, with a parent. I thought I taught three of her sons in a row. Um, so um, she had uh, three sons that went through my class and, um, and the first son that went through, I got to know him really well. He skated on my skateboard team and, um, and we would talk kind of casually. Um, her second son, same, he skated on my skateboard team. He went through my class, you know, but her third son was different than the first two. Um, and so the third son was the one that needed a lot of support, um, and a lot of work. 
And, um, and, and because we had a relationship through the first two sons, we were able to co-create this experience for her third son that was really powerful for him. It really saw him, you know, she was like, he's not like my first two boys. He's not going to sit there and listen to you, you know, like, and she was just really upfront, you know, she's like, I know my kids. Um, and, and, and he's the one that gives me the most headaches. I love him just the same, but you know, you're getting a very different kid with my third son. Um, and, and that left such an imprint on me because like that kid got an incredible experience because I was able to collaborate with his mom and, and to some great extent, his two older brothers. And, um, and, and after teaching him, one of the, the questions that I had for myself is like, how could I create that intimate and experience for every kid? So how can I like, you know, labor to listen to their parents, labor to really understand their needs or their wants or labor to understand their passions. And so really it goes back to that very simple act of listening that, that we as teachers are often apt to do this thing where we're like, okay, I taught essays last year or I taught poetry last year. So I'm going to dust off my lesson plans from last year and just do it again, you know, but to say, you know what, I taught poetry last year but I had the older brothers last year and now I got the younger brother and he's a wildly different kid. And so when I teach poetry this year, I've got to teach it in a way that gets to him, you know? And what's, what's interesting is we often teach the same thing year after year. And then we blame the kids. We're like, well, he didn't get it. Marshall didn't get it because it's his fault. And really, and what his mom was trying to teach me, his mom was trying to teach me that you can't teach my third son like he taught my first two. I loved you as a teacher for my first two, but my third son, that's a different kid. And so you're going to have to change it up for him. Um, and, and it would have been really easy to teach the third son like I taught the first two and then say, well, something's wrong with you because they work for your two brothers. It's just not working for you. So that's on you, kid. Um, but instead, to really be reflective and to say, actually, that's on me. Like that this kid is different than any other kid that I've taught and I can listen to him. I can think about him and I can craft a curriculum that meets him where he is. Um, and I think that, you know, when you study like universal design for learning and when you think about access, that's all it is. It's, it's creating access points for kids so that they don't just see themselves, but they, they see their own abilities and they see their own potential inside of what I'm trying to do for them and with them. Wow. We'll, oh. we'll let you run on this. Where can our listeners go to le learn more from and with you? Cool. Well, I keep a blog. Um, my wife and I share a blog. So it's cassandcorn.com. So K-A-S-S-A-N-D-C-O-R-N.com is my blog. Um, you can go to Heinemann.com, my publisher, to find out more about my book. Um, I have a very, very active Twitter presence. Um, so I'm on Twitter at Mr. Minor, M-I-S-T-E-R-M-I-N-O-R. Um, and every now and then I'll creep on Instagram. So I'm on Instagram at Corn like Cornelius Minor. So C-O-R-N-E-L-I-U-S-M-I-N-O-R. Um, but, you know, you can always find me in these Brooklyn streets. So, <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's close up shop. Becky, what did you learn? Well, there are so many things that stuck with me after this interview. I feel so proud and lucky that he spoke with us on here. Um, but one of the things that keeps popping into my head is how he described his team at the beginning from his first school, how he said he had an incredible team of teachers, parents, and students. And it's just such a genuine description of who he worked with. It wasn't just him and his content team or him and his grade level team, but he truly partnered with students and parents. And I think that that's something that we can all aspire to. Uh, and it really comes through in his book, too. It's it's I highly, highly encourage all of you to to get it and devour it. Um, because the other thing that I really learned from the book and also from the interview is how how much more I want to be like him with how open he is to iteration. I feel like we talk about iteration all the time, but he basically lives action research. And I, I know I personally need to be way more intentional about the impact that I have, like reflecting on those things and seeing what works and what doesn't. Um, and it really, again, reminds me of when Hattie talked about know they impact. I feel like Cornelius really lives that phrase. He knows the impact of every movie makes because he's so metacognitive. And that's something else I think we could all be better at. How about you, Ben? Yeah, to I agree with what you had just said, but I, I think one of my bigger takeaways was really just the analogy that he gave after the story about his team being apprehended in the museum and just how it really is part of my responsibility to talk to my white friends about racism. And that's definitely something I've never done. And I want to work harder at that and talking to people I come in contact with about how my job and my personal life can promote equity for everybody. 
That's awesome. That was a, a hard conversation, but we need to have more of those so that we can bring those things to the forefront more often. It's definitely our responsibility. So uh, let's all go have harder conversations and uh, have a great generic time of day.